We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. 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 Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Today, my guest is Comcast's Chief Technology Officer, Matt Zalesko. Matt leads the product organization, which is focused on delivering best in class products in three key areas digital home, including XFi, Xfinity Home, entertainment, encompassing X1, Flex, and Stream, and AI and Discovery focused on AI, voice, discovery, and personalization platforms. His team connects customers to moments that matter through great product experiences built on global platforms. From connectivity to entertainment, these products matter to customers now more than ever. And Matt's teams are dedicated to make them simple, personal, and awesome. Prior to Comcast, he led the technology strategy and product development for Time Warner Cable and Juiced. We're grateful to have you share your experiences and stories of generosity with us. Welcome to ROG. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So we got a chance to meet because you were a Raider for a 360 degree review for one of my favorite clients. And I find that ironic because here you were doing something really generous to support and advance the career success of a colleague. And we got on this topic of gratitude, which lit both of us up. And we thought, oh my gosh, this would be so great to get to share you on ROG. So thank you for contributing to your colleagues and for sharing your insights. Yeah, I think we pretty quickly found some shared interests, both in podcasting and in gratitude. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So speaking of podcasting, I have had the privilege of listening to and enjoying some of your podcasts. So you have one called Z Time with Matt Zaletsko, where you get to share your insights. And just tell me what was the impetus for starting a podcast? Yeah. So we spend a lot of time listening to our team members and understanding what they need to do their best work. And one of the things we heard over and over again is this need for a connection between what somebody is doing every day and our overall strategy, where we're going, our mission, kind of the big arc that we're going on and how their work is contributing to that or how their work is impacting that. And so we found a number of different ways to do it. And it started off with me meeting with small groups of employees. So what we would try and do is sit down with 20 to 30 employees and me, and it was a little bit of both me um, sharing what was on my mind, what were the big things I was thinking about, and also hearing a lot of feedback from them and answering questions. You know, the goal was I did enough of these so that over the course of a quarter, I met with everybody in the organization in one of these formats. And we, we actually called that Z time. That was the original Z time. Uh, through a series of events, the organization got a lot bigger. And it just, I, I'm so grateful to my comms team that sat me down and said, there is no way you can do enough Z times in a quarter to get the entire organization. And so we realized we had to pivot. And at the same time, we had, we have this great accelerator program for startups inside of Comcast through, through a group called Lift Labs. And one of those startups was actually a, a podcast startup and focused on enterprise podcasts. So the two things connected and we said, wait a second, we can reinvent Z time to be a podcast and reach all of the employees on a much more frequent basis, which we were pretty excited about. Yeah. And you've had so many amazing guests and have covered topics that are really relevant to the employee experience. And as we know, that is such a critical part of the customer experience is that it starts internally. You invest in your team. You give them access to information, to their leaders, to just different ways of looking at things. It's such a smart way to scale personal communication. It really is. And a few things surprised me about podcasts. The first one was they're actually pretty hard. So one of the things that you have started is the practice of gratitude. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, sure. And again, this came back to uh, addressing feedback or addressing needs from the team. The first one is connecting their work to what were our overall vision. This one was much more around recognition. And 
you know, we heard from employees that they, they wanted to be recognized. And I think there's a number of vehicles for that. But as I thought about it, you know, I really dug in and said, boy, just recognizing a great job or a great um, performance, if you will, in a meeting from, from somebody can go a long way. And so I, it started, as you said, with a simple New Year's resolution, which was every day I was going to send one note of gratitude. So some interaction I had with someone, whether it was one-on-one or in a large meeting, um, at the end of the day, I was going to sit down, pull out one, and then write a note. And the rules were pretty simple, right? It was just write a very short email, but I knew I had to be specific. It wasn't just sort of, I appreciate you. It was, here's what I saw you do today. Here's why it was so great. And I appreciate you. And just kind of adding that, that what into it or the why um, was, was really the only rule. And so I started doing it. And I mean, it has had such amazing results. Like what? Like what are some of the reactions and results that you've seen from this practice? There's a few things. I think um, the first thing is, is that the gratitude is so good for others, right? It, it really had profound effects on those who receive it. Maybe you could say, yes, that's because this was coming from the leader of their organization. But I, I think it really, whoever expresses gratitude has a lot of meaning to the receiver. And I really saw that it was meaningful when someone got one of these notes of gratitude. The second thing is I saw that it was really contagious. So people that received gratitude went on to share that with somebody else, which was um, pretty exciting as well. The, the thing I didn't anticipate as much was how meaningful the, the practice was to me, how I felt about it. Because what I found was, um, you know, it's not hard, but it forces you at the end of every day to find some good things in that day. Exiting a day thinking about some of the good things has been just very meaningful to me, and particularly in the challenging times we're in now. You know, exiting a day thinking about some of the highlights as opposed to some of the challenges or issues or other things has been very meaningful to me. It has been statistically proven that gratitude is good for you (laughs) in some of the ways that you just talked about, right? There's like the physical benefits of your immune system and lower blood pressure. And then there's psychological benefits, like you get this high of positive emotions and you feel joy and optimism. Then you get this social value where you just feel like your relationships are stronger. It's worth it for the impact that it has on others. And the fact that it has an impact on me is just sort of a, a wonderful extra bonus. I really appreciate that you're both a technically minded individual and you're conscious about the emotional intelligence and the investment that you're making in people from this personal connection. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I clearly come from a technical background. I was dangerously close to getting a PhD in computer science at one point, but I discovered leadership and realized all of the facets of leadership and the importance of investing in culture, the importance in creating a highly talented team and then doing the right thing, setting the right conditions for that team to be amazing. And that excites me as much as the technology does in a lot of ways. And, you know, I think in a lot, we are working with teams that have to innovate every day right? And in order to foster innovation, you really need to have a culture of safety and creativity, you know, a culture that rewards risk-taking and, um, and celebrates failure. And so, you know, the, you have to do active things. You don't get to dictate the culture, but you have to do active behaviors and leading by example to make sure that those things come through. And so I think a lot about that. I probably think a lot more about culture and organizational behavior and communications than I do about technology on a given day, because I have great technologists on my team. For you to say that safety is that critical piece in software development and all of these other realms is something for us to take take note of. You know, so what does that mean for us? And you don't just mean physical safety, you mean emotional and psychological safety. That's right. Emotional and psychological safety. So that you can come as your whole self and put in your best work every day. We have this wonderful culture of continuous improvement, right? We 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 really foster a growth mindset. We want to just continually get better at what we do. 
I've found though that sometimes when you're in this continuous improvement environment, what you what you're doing, and what I, I found this, I was reflecting on my staff meeting. A lot of times in my staff meeting, what we're doing is highlighting all the problems because we are continuous improvers. So what you do is you find a problem and you make it better and you find a problem and make it better. Um, going back to like some of the emotional effects of gratitude and things like that, where you were focused on the good things that happened. I think we need to balance some of that, find a problem, make it better with what are we doing well and how do we do that better? And there's, there's sort of a field that I'm just dipping my toe in called appreciative inquiry. That is all about that, right? That, you know, um, let's figure out what our strengths are. Like, yes, we should look at our problems and our weaknesses and figure out how to continuously improve them. But let's also look at our strengths and figure out how we build on top of those. And I think having a balance between those is probably the right answer. Absolutely. And appreciative inquiry, in my experience, is the original AI. (laughs) Yes, I know. (laughs) So have you started a new process in your staff meetings where you highlight some of what's going well? It's brand new and we're just digging into it. And maybe that, again, is a great example of continuous improvement, but it's trying to understand how we as a leadership team can make the best use of our time, but also the biggest impact on the organization. We've all been kicking around and want to figure out how we tease apart the continuous improvement of problems, but then also let's really spend some time talking about our strengths too, because I just don't think we do that enough. When we come back, Matt will share about how to create an inclusive culture. Introducing the brand new QuadPod Podcast Network. At QuadPod, we have a variety of podcasts that are as unique as you. When you visit QuadPod.com, you'll see our shows listed by category as well as average episode length. Find a new podcast at qodpod.com, the QuadPod Podcast Network. That's qodpod.com. And we're back with more from Matt Zalesko. Many of the people who are probably excelling in your organization are those type A, go get them, look for what's next. And that's such a great attribute, right? To always be looking for ways to improve. And you're saying, yes, and. Yes, let's always look ahead and get better. And let's not lose sight of what we're already doing well. What are some keys to creating a culture where people belong and feel like they matter? As a leadership team, you don't get to choose the culture. Unless you're a really small team starting a company, maybe you get to dictate. You see a lot of founder-driven cultures in small startups. But you know, when you're talking the scale of something like Comcast or the scale of teams that, 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 that I have that are thousands of people, um, you don't get to just say, guess what, everybody? Here's our culture. It's ABC. Go have at it, right? These cultures are organic, they evolve, and they're the reflection of millions of micro interactions that are happening in the organization all the time, right? So what you can do as a leader is sort of set your aspiration for where that is, and then really both lead by example, which I said before, like the the organization is really astute if you're words and your body language are out of sync, right? So if I'm saying the words that this is our culture and I'm doing other things with my actions, organizations pick that up in a second and it's out the window, right? So if anything, I think as leaders, you have to be the best stewards of the behaviors that you want to see. And then I think when you see it in others and you see the ones that are positively reinforcing the culture, you need to make a huge deal out of those. Make sure everybody sees it, everybody understands it. When you see things that go against the culture, and guess what you will, um, there's, even if we're going through a process of change, there's always regression on the way to progress. Um, you've got to address those things too. Now, you're going to address those in a much more private situation, right? You don't want to publicly sort of call things out. Although in, in times, I will say, there's been someone that's gone against the culture and it's been publicly visible enough that I feel like I publicly have to go and say, 
this didn't fit our culture, right? And we, we need to fix that. Um, but generally, it's all about, you know, really endorsing and supporting those times when there's great cultural tenets that are being demonstrated in behaviors and, and trying to change and improve the cases where it's not being demonstrated. Absolutely. That recognition and gratitude for the positive modeling and then the accountability and feedback to anyone who is demonstrating behavior that's counterculture or something that's not conducive to the kind of environment that you've created. So that makes me think you must be clear about your expectations about what is the behavior that we aspire to or model here. So are you explicitly clear about what you expect? Yeah. And uh, one other observation there, it's easy as you get a larger and larger organization for it to get very hierarchical that, you know, um, teams don't necessarily feel empowered decisions get made higher in the organization. And, you know, my experience is that means you've got a slower decision-making process and they typically are worse decisions at the end of the day. And so we've spent a lot of time purposely pushing empowerment down in the organization. We want the people closest to the work making those decisions because they make those decisions faster and they also make better decisions, right? They've got much more context and and they're able to do it. So we've really tried to emphasize pushing empowerment deeper in the organization. And a lot of that goes to um, what we were talking about before with celebrating failure. So look, every decision that gets made deep in the organization is not going to be a good decision, right? And so you've got to almost reward, you can't punish poor decision-making when you wanted to push the decision-making down. So again, it's a lot about you know, making sure you've set the right context that goes, I know you're not going to make the right decision all the time, but we're going to help you make decisions. We, we are going to help you and support you so that you do feel empowered and accountable to do those things. And um, that takes a lot. And, and the other observation is real creativity, I find, is happening more and more on the borders of different functions, right? It's not just one team, but it's the, how the teams intersect. And so we've been thinking a lot about how you work between teams and how you create this cross-functional collaboration um, between those teams. And again, that is a lot about building trust between those teams. The, the teams have to trust each other. They've got to be very aligned in what they're trying to build and create. And, and then you get out of the way, but you've got to sort of set the, the context there, because if you don't have trust, if you don't have that that groundwork, then you're not going to actually get stuff out the other side. For sure. And then there's more emphasis on who's going to get the credit, who's going to meet their KPIs, who's going to be the rock star of the day versus how are we collectively looking at winning in a broader sense. It's an important transition to shift from individual goals and achievements to you know, how does this affect the customer? And I know that's harder to quantify and less simple to put metrics against, but that's a really elegant problem to solve. Yeah. And we, we tend to call that um, focusing more on outcomes than output, you know, understanding what outcome we're trying to achieve and then allowing the teams to figure out the best way to get to that. Um, but getting back to your gratitude, I think also there's a lot of recognition sharing that has to happen when you've got these cross-functional organizations, meaning um, here's a good example. We've got teams that are, you know, building the, the UI, the actual interface to the product that you're interacting with. Think about your TV and the navigation experience on your TV. And you've got a lot of teams building platforms behind the scenes that really make that experience sing. And it's unfortunately natural to give the team that's building the thing closest to the customer and the thing that's most visual, most of the credit. And that couldn't be further from the truth because there's all these teams behind them that are really making that thing amazing. And so there's been a lot of deliberate effort to make sure that that is one team that's going to get the reward together as opposed to individual parts of this thing being recognized for work that, that spans well beyond them. That's like the actors in the series or the musicians in the band or the, right, the, the people that we see first is, oh, this 
they made a great movie. It's all of the people behind the scenes that made that piece of art that we call media. So one of your favorite quotes is that good leaders create followers, great leaders create leaders. This notion that great leaders create leaders is, you know, very uh, personal to me because I think that is the commitment to my leadership team is that I want to work with them and I want to push them. And similarly, I want them to push me. Like one of the things I like the best is, um, you know, we have a very open culture and they're, they're very willing to tell me if I'm not doing something right. Um, as I said, I make mistakes every day. And so, you know, I think all of us thinking about that role of leader that we've talked a lot about today, but how we create that next generation of leaders that can foster the same kind of environment moving forward. Yeah, when you talked about pushing down empowerment and making sure that the people who have the most context and are closest to the thing, the technology, are empowered to make the decision, that is a great example of your instilling leadership expectation that you expect that people will step up and make those decisions. And I think that's it's just an awesome way to contribute to people's careers as well. Better for you and the organization and, and the outcomes and everything else, but it's also good for the individual that they get a chance to have a lane that they can really own and drive. So one of your other favorite quotes is, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Dr. Maya Angelou, what does that speak to you? Well, it's a few things. I think it speaks to a lot of the things we talked about today, right? One of them is continuous improvement, which is when you find you can do something better, do it better. I think it also includes vulnerability. Admit you didn't know better and then do better. It's hitting a lot of those same things, vulnerability and continuous improvement. And really, this resonated with me as we really launched on our diversity and equity and inclusion efforts during the course of 2020. I talked about the nationwide focus on violence against Black Americans and systemic racism that underpins that. And this was a very powerful time inside our company. I'm really proud of the stance that Comcast took here. And also the kind of personal awakening in me in the sense that, you know, we've talked a lot about the culture and I really prided uh, myself and our organization on creating a culture where everybody can bring their whole self to work. We talked about that as being fundamental to the psychological safety before, right? And what I realized through listening to a lot of our black teammates was, there's a number of them that can't bring their whole self to work today. They don't feel comfortable doing that. And so for me, this was a mission (laughs) that we had to go in and we had to change this. It started with a lot of listening and a lot of education, right? Mostly listening and then expressing. And what I realized during that time was there is no way I'm going to get this right on day one. In fact, I'm almost guaranteed I'm going to mess some stuff up, right? And instead of waiting for a point where we could get everything right, that we had experts in that would help us get everything right, I felt that the urgency of the moment, it was important to just start wading in there and having difficult conversations. And so what I tried to impress to the team was, this is gonna be messy, we're gonna mess things up, we're gonna make mistakes, but we're doing this from a place of caring and wanting to do it and having urgency around it. And so this quote grounded me during this time, which was, I'm gonna do the best I can right now. And a lot of smart people inside my company are going to educate me on what I'm not doing the right way or educate me on how I could do it better. And then I'm gonna commit to doing it better. That's beautiful to hear. And what a great encouragement. It doubles back to what you said earlier about how it's always about learning. And in this case, you were learning by understanding and empathizing and hearing what are the experiences. Here's how I want it to be. What is it actually like for you? And then what's in the gap and how do we work on bridging that? So for those who are listening and feeling shame about not stepping into that space, not putting themselves in that uncomfortable learner position, what would you suggest to make themselves more accessible to this type of learning? Yeah, I think number one, there's no excuse for not educating yourself. 
and there are so many great books to, to, to read just because I think you do want to come in with some context, but then just finding some people to have a conversation with and starting with vulnerability over the course of 25 days, did 25 listening sessions across our organization. And we had some strong, talented, brilliant Black teammates that shared their experiences, as painful as that was for them, they carried a lot of this load. You should aspire to get in that direction of hearing other perspectives, developing empathy. And that is all about just how do you use questions to develop empathy and safety in a team? I think that's another great place to start is from the context that your intent is to learn and be vulnerable enough to say that you don't know and then just start asking questions and just listen. And I think that'll go a long way. Thanks for the encouragement to do the work, to, to read the books, listen to the podcasts. That's something I've been overwhelmed by is how much information is available, how many extraordinary resources are out there. Um, Michael Bush wrote The Great Place to Work for All, and he talks about these five categories of leaders and the, the top is the for all leader, the person who's for everyone. And then I love this Jennifer Brown book called How to Be an Inclusive Leader. It's very straightforward, really uh, gives great framework. And I think, you know, there's things like that. And then I, that humble inquiry, I want to check that one out. That sounds too much. Okay. I'm always humbled by the role that our products play in our customers' lives. It is more true now with us all working from home than ever, but internet connectivity is the way that people work today. That's the way people learn today. We are building products for such a diverse set of customers that we really need a diverse team building them. I want our products to reflect every customer. And in order to do that, I need product and technology teams that look like all of our customers. There's, there's no substitute for that. So if I aspire to build the best products, I want to have a team that is as diverse and inclusive as possible and is bringing in all these different viewpoints that are ultimately going to make it better. Thank you for being a model for the kind of leader that I believe we need to see more of. And it's not as common that we get to meet leaders who are so invested in their culture and committed to gratitude and that you find something every single day to acknowledge and that you're really specific about that and that you open yourself up in ways to continually grow and improve and also to demonstrate for people, look, I'm a work in progress too. I think that's terrific, Matt. I so appreciate you making time to share with us. Oh, I'm very grateful that you had me on and um, I really enjoyed the conversation. It's always wonderful to speak with you. Our OG takeaway tip, how to apply what we've learned to our own work and lives. Matt shared so many examples of habits, rituals, and practices that are transferable to any workplace, like continuous communication. Every workplace I've ever worked in has an opportunity here. So ask yourself, how can I communicate even more to my team, colleagues, peers, and community? What creative solutions could I try to cascade my message even more broadly and consistently? Matt started a podcast to reach more people. What could you do? Gratitude. Begin a daily gratitude practice, please. <laughs> In Matt's daily message, he shares what he saw the person do and why that's so great. It's not generic and vague. It's specific and personal. If every day seems like too much, try once a week. Review the week. Think of who's in your highlight reel and thank them specifically for their contribution. Another great transferable piece of encouragement is to learn from mistakes. How do we treat setbacks and failures as a catalyst for growth? What's an example of something that's gone wrong recently? What can you learn from it? Set up a virtual meeting with the people involved and facilitate a discussion. What were our assumptions? What was our plan? How did this miss the mark? What are the learning lessons and how can we share this with others? To be an effective and generous leader, we must stay committed to continuous learning. Dr. Maya Angelou said it best, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Stay generous, everyone. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. 
Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.